My next guest tonight is a accomplished live fire cook, ready to grill or barbecue or whatever the fire should tell him to do. He will do it. The ninth, uh, the April 9th finds. Oh, 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 let me see. What are we doing here? Uh, the uh, April 9th will find the release of his first book, Grill Seeker, Basic Training for Everyday Grilling, which you can pre-order right now on Amazon. Tonight, we're going to be talking about grilling and sous vide. So, let's head to the hotline and welcome back friend of the show, Matt Eads. And fingers crossed. Matt, how are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you? All right. We are sounding live, live oh, this yeah. time. All right. It looks good. It works this time, right? Yeah, this time. Second time's a charm. I think that's what <laughs> to say, Matt. Yeah. So on topic for this evening is grilling first. Matt, do you define a difference between barbecue and grilling? And if so, how do you uh, generally say this is one and this is the other? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I think that I do certainly, um, when I think about barbecue, I, I think generally about, uh, you know, sort of the competition circuit, right. And those folks that have really established themselves with, uh, with cooking ribs and chicken and, uh, you know, pork butt and brisket, like those guys are some real warriors and they spend a lot of time perfecting, uh, perfecting their game. And so when I think about barbecue, traditional barbecue, that's what I think about grilling, I think is a different sort of genre. Um, you know, I'm grilling all kinds of stuff, whether it's, uh, you know, a banana split or, you know, banana split. a burger or a dog. Yeah, banana split. Uh, shameless plug. It's in the book. Uh, if you want to grill a banana split, I, I do that in there. Uh, you know, I love paella on the grill. Uh, and those are the types of things that I think are, you know, traditional grilling things versus, uh, you know, barbecue. Matt Eads joining me here on the show. Uh, Matt, do you have a preference of fuel source when you're grilling? Uh, you know, it just depends. I think it, it, it really depends on the mood. It was interesting. I was listening to the segment just a little bit earlier and you were talking to the guys from Green Mountain and I just reviewed one of their grills earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it was the, uh, the tailgater. I think it's the Davy Crockett is the name of it, right? Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, for the price point, you can't beat it. It puts out great food, um, works as advertised. It's, it's great. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, each grill ha has sort of its place. I'm not a huge fan of pellet grills in general. I've got a, I've got a couple of them, uh, and I use them certainly, but it, you know, they wouldn't be my go-to, but they, they certainly have their place. So, uh, I think it, for me, it just depends on the mood, the company and by company, I mean, if I've got a house full of people and I've got to cook a bunch of food, uh, you know, pellet grill is great because I don't have to tend to it much, but if it's just me and a couple of buddies hanging out, you know, maybe I want to, maybe I want to fire up the offset, uh, you know, depends. Some of the more, uh, experienced grillers tend to turn their nose up at use the use of uh, natural or liquid <laughs> propane gas. Are you a nose turner or no? I am not a nose turner. Um, <laughs> that, that's funny. Really, people that uh, that define who you are by what you cook on. I just, I've never really, never really understood that. Um, you know, I, I cook on gas quite a bit, probably at this point more than, than I, I do charcoal. Um, but so no, the short answer is no, I'm not a, I'm not a, a nose turner and, uh, I don't, uh, I don't begrudge anybody that cooks exclusively on a pellet or a gas grill or, you know, or a charcoal grill. The, the idea for me is just getting outside making great memories, great food with your family and friends and, and having a ball doing it. And I think one of the key things that you had mentioned earlier, I mean, it, it kind of depends on situation and the company yeah. that you're keeping and whatever protein that you might be trying to prepare, you know, gas grill is certainly convenient. Charcoal is I think a lot more convenient than it used to be with the advent of the charcoal chimney and the way that's really taken off. Plus people realize now, well, I can put this charcoal chimney on a outdoor gas burner and it's going to actually light a lot quicker. So yeah, I don't know if there's maybe a negligible difference in speed if you're going to use gas grill to charcoal, but you know, a little game planning ahead of time, get you that charcoal grill going and it's just as convenient. No big deal. Uh, plus, you can do a little bit more with uh, the thermodynamics of a charcoal grill than you obviously you can do with a gas grill. So, uh, you know, I, I have pellet cookers and gas grills and offsets and everything in between because I think, uh, A, there's every once in a blue moon, man, on a good summer's night or evening, you can have all those things going and you can look like an absolute stud, right? But yeah. everything has its definitive reason of why you have it. You're just not trying to show off, but everything's right. got its own 
a piece. So I always encourage people to, to buy multiple cookers over time. Uh, not all at once, I guess, if you don't have the money, but uh, that's what I like. So uh, dovetailing into the main topic at hand here this evening, which is sous vide grilling. So if we talk about there are some people that turn their nose up at folks who use gas when they're doing their grilling, mm-hmm. there is certainly never been a more polarizing subject to talk about over the last 24 or maybe even 36 months than the use of a sous vide machine in correspondence with either barbecue or grilling. So first things first, when were you first introduced to sous vide cooking and did you realize the potential or did you kind of, were you attracted to it initially or is it something that you had to get infected with and then become a fan of? Yeah, I, um, I think the probably been using sous vide for, I'm going to guess about two, two years, three years maybe ish. Um, and really when I first started with sous vide, I thought it was sort of gimmicky. Um, I thought, eh, w- what could possibly be the point of this thing? Um, and the first couple of times I used it, I thought, wow, there's, there's really some, some value here. Um, and really for me, the value is, and I, I would start by saying if, you know, weather permitting and time permitting, I'm always going to use, uh, you know, I'm always going to use a grill to cook meat. Um, but there's some benefits to sous vide and, uh, you know, just today, as a matter of fact, I finished up a recipe for uh, uh, sort of a combination between sous vide and barbecue um, or grilling. So I did uh, a corned beef today, and it, it and it was just it turned out perfect. But um, so I think that there's again, there's a time and a place for things, and you know, we live in a busy society, and people have got kids to take to soccer and jobs and things like that, and you know, you could throw something in a sous vide, and and you can go and do dropping the kids off at soccer, or whatever the case may be, and and unattended. So I'm a fan of sous vide for the convenience. I think that there are certainly things that serve better for sous vide. I really like pork and chicken sous vide much more than beef. I will tell you that um, benefit, at least for me, um, with beef is that you can kind of soak it in, in butter for you know a couple of hours and really get some good flavor that way. Um, the other huge thing for me about sous vide is, uh, is, is vodka. I love to infuse vodka with the sous vide and you can do it kinds of crazy things with uh with uh with vodka and and, and infusing flavors in it yeah so i saw you happen to drop that in some correspondence that we were having as we were setting up for the segment and you talked about infusing vodka yeah so what does that mean exactly Uh, you're pouring vodka in the bag and you're putting some type of a botanical in there or like kind of making it into a gin of sorts or what's the deal on on uh, the flavors that you're infusing yeah, sort of the sky's the limit. So I would say with vodka, you're not going to use a bag like you would for, you know, typically, a, you know, a, a steak or a pork chop or whatever. You just put it in a little glass jar, mason jar or whatever. Um, but you can do anything from, you know, pineapple is one of my favorites. There's a uh, there's a local steakhouse uh, and they serve a drink called the Stoli Doli, which is essentially a Stolichevich vodka. I think that's how it's pronounced. Maybe I'm just made a fool of myself. Um but whatever it is, it's uh, it's a Russian vodka, right? And they they infuse it with this uh, pineapple. And, and I was talking to the bartender, and he said uh, he said, "Hey, look, I, I make this stuff here. Uh, we infuse it 30 days, and essentially he's cutting fresh uh, fresh pineapple and throwing it in the vodka. And he, he says it takes 30 days before it's ready to serve. Hmm. Um, but you can do that in sous vide in like three hours by cutting the same the same fresh pineapple, throwing it into the vodka into a into a mason jar." You know, I run it at 155 and go for about three hours and you can get this incredibly uh, diverse flavor of, of, of uh, pineapple vodka. Um, you can do, you know, cilantro. It's a really fun one. Cilantro vodka is, is, is interesting. You can do some jalapeno vodka is a great for, hmm. uh, for Bloody Marys. Um, so it, really the sky is the limit. Apple's another great one. The sky really is the limit for, for vodka and what you can infuse with it. So is it the heat that's making the whole thing come together in three day or three hours versus 30 days. He's just putting yes. it in a, in a bottle and sticking it on a shelf somewhere and just letting time do its thing. Otherwise that's that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and when I say three hours, I mean, three hours of cook time and, you know, at 155 degrees, right. I wouldn't recommend pulling it st- straight out of the 155 degree water. I mean, you might risk the, the glass breaking or whatever if you, if you cool it down too quick. So after, after the three hours of cook time, I just turn off the cooker, the little sous vide cooker, and, uh, and, and just let it roll and, you know, within an hour or so it's cooled down and, and, you, and you're ready to go. So that's infused vodka, but from a meat cooking standpoint, where do you really see the benefit or what's your favorite 
meat to use in a sous vide situation? Yeah, I think uh, for me, it's really about the, um, the thicker cuts of meat. So if you're going to do something thin, like a thin cut pork chop, a thinner cut of steak, when I say thin, I'm talking less than, you know, less than an inch in thickness. Um, you know, those things are, are easy to do hot and fast. And really the, the benefit of a sous vide is not going to, is not going to really be there. Um, but if you've got a thicker cut of meat, specifically like uh, a filet mignon, which I think, you know, and I posted about this the other day, I think a filet mignon is one of the, probably the most disappointing cuts of meat to get at a restaurant. Yes. Seemingly it's always overdone. And I tried to show that in a picture that I posted. Um, there you go. Uh, and you can see around the outer edge, like if you just try to sear a filet, any thick cut of meat, I used a filet here, but if you just try to sear any thick cut of meat, you're going to get that well done sort of ring around the outside and nobody really likes that. And, and, and the other side is, is sous vide and you can see that it's, it's pretty much the edge doneness. So if there's a favorite cut, I don't know that I would say a favorite cut. I would say a thickness. And, and what I'm looking at is, you know, inch and a half or, or thicker on any cut of meat, I think really benefits from sous vide. Um, and, and a big portion of that is, is seasoning the meat before it goes into, uh, into the vacuum pack. So you see, cause I've read a number of different ideas or concepts on when the seasoning should happen. I've heard mm -hmm. that people say, Hey, throw the steak in there, get it to whatever temperature you want it. And we'll talk about times here in a second, but then once sure. it comes out of the bag, pat it dry, as dry as you can get, then add the seasoning, then it goes onto the grill for a minute each side, blah, 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 just to get the sear color on and away you go. Then I've heard other people say like you and I, myself, I season the steak first, put it in the bag, let the vacuum thing kind of do the penetration and uh, reseason a little bit when it comes back out and then onto the grill to finish it. So uh, you find that seasoning prior to going into the bag is what works best for you? I think, I think it works best. Here's why. And, and, and there's, you know, there's plenty of schools of thought about this and people are all going to have their own opinion. You know, I love pepper. I hate pepper on steak before it goes over a, a heat source. I think it gets very bitter and it just doesn't taste great. Mm -hmm. um, so with sous vide, I can put some pepper on a steak, pork chop, whatever it's going to be. I get the, the good pepper flavor and then I can cook it over whatever temperature that I want. And I don't get that bitter, burnt pepper flavor. Um, and so folks that, you know, may be new to that concept or, you know, maybe disagree, I would just say, look, everyone, everyone has their own opinion, but give it a shot one time. Do a steak, do a pork chop, whatever. Season one with pepper before you put it on the grill or before you put it on your heat source and do one without it and just pepper it after. And tell me if you think it, there's a difference in flavor. And, and I think that, you know, if, if folks are honest, you, you feel like maybe the, the pepper over a direct flame it tends to get a little bit bitter. Matt, from a time perspective, obviously the temperature is going to be more of what you prefer if you want medium yeah. rare or medium, what are you going to have to set that temperature? But how long do you let it sit in the bath? Because I've heard also different schools of thought, well, it can't be any longer than an hour or an hour and a half or don't do over two or three because when you pull it out of the bag, it's just going to fall apart, blah, blah, blah. To me, that's more tender, but what do you think? Yeah. I think, uh, I think a few things. So I would think, you know, for me, rule of thumb for a steak, I usually go around two hours and I usually roll at 125 just because I like something a little bit more towards medium rare plus. Um, but for chicken, you know, I'm going probably four hours. And so, you know, the FDA puts out regulations about, uh, you know, temperature of chicken and people get stuck on what those temperatures are for safe eating. But those temperatures are really based on the time it takes to kill bacteria in a nine second period. Yeah. So they want temperatures that high so that you can kill bacteria in nine seconds. But if you, if you cook chicken at 140 for four hours, you could eat it safely then. It wouldn't taste great, but you could eat it. It's still going to be really juicy. So, you know, for me, time perspective, again, depends on what kind of meat I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm eating. Chicken, I'm going four hours. Steak, I'm going to be about an hour and a half to two hours. So you're not at 125 on chicken. Are you no. into the 150s or 145 um, or where are you at? Yeah, 145 for me for chicken, four hours at 145, just because I want to get a really nice sear at the end. And, you know, obviously that's where the good flavor comes from. Um, but yeah, 145 on chicken. What are you using to do the sear? Are you cast iron guy? Are you grill grates on a gas grill kind of thing? What's your preference? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good one. So grill grates look really sexy and, and uh, you know, obviously it's a great product. People, people seem to really like it. I'm not a huge fan of the grill marks myself. I like the overall char. So, uh, you know, if, if weather permitting, I'm going outside and firing up the grill and, and I'm going to steer it that way. 
if the weather's horrible, if, uh, you know, and I live in, I live in Virginia and, and you can't really count on the weather here. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, sometimes we're snow or rain. Most of the time we're snow or rain or yeah. wind. Uh, and, and so then I'm, I'm cast iron and oftentimes I combine the two. Sometimes I want that cast iron sear and I'll just throw it on the grill because I just love to be outside cooking. And, uh, and so I'll sear the meat and the cast iron over a grill. Now I am a fan of the grill grates. And yeah. on the current grill that I have, actually on every grill that I've had since my first Weber, and I'm actually transitioning into a, a new Weber here in the next couple of days, and I'll get grill grates for that. Half are rails up, but then you can also invert yeah. and go rails down. So you have, in essence, a griddle top. Now, it's not a true griddle because there's the air holes that are in it right. as well. So you would lose something if it was a little bit more viscous. Mm -hmm. But I get that uh, griddle side as hot as I can, and that's what I did that steak the other night that I had put on Instagram a minute on each side, and it was hot enough to get that nice. I'm with you. Overall browning over grill marks. I've never yeah. understood grill marks. I don't get it. Uh, I think it's starting to take over the competitive steak situation, which is a whole other diatribe that we could get yeah. into at a later date. Yeah. But overall browning means better flavor, so that's what I like. Yeah, I'm with you. Let me ask you this. So when you're using the, the grill grate upside down, and I've seen some people do that, are you able to get some seasoning on, on, on the grate itself so you can get some flavor infused from that as well? Or? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yep. Yep. I've not, I've not used them. I, I see them a lot for the, for the grill marks, and maybe that's what sort of turned me off because I'm just not like a really a grill mark guy, but, um, but I can see the benefit of, of, of the reverse side of it. Matt Eads is the author of a new book coming up uh, April 9th. It's called Grill Seeker. Basic training for everyday grilling. Are we still like hot and heavy on the pre-orders, Matt, or what? Yeah, things are going really, really well. I've actually, um, you know, it's 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 very humbling. I've, I've got, uh, I think there's about seven at this point, seven uh, morning shows across the country that are oh. uh, that have asked me to come on and, and and do a cooking segment and talk about the book. And there's a handful of others that ex express some interest. So, uh, so I'm really excited. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to to. Uh, I've never done that before. I've seen some other folks doing it. Um, but you know, I'm really excited to do it. The uh, the pre-orders are 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 much stronger than I ever thought, and uh, yeah, I'm excited and, and certainly very humbled by it. All right. Well, uh, I've always said that springtime is what brings the barbecue and grilling cookbooks out, and this is one you're going to want to add to that collection. Again, April 9th is the drop, but you can pre-order right now on Amazon. Grill Seeker Basic Training for Everyday Grilling. It's Matt Eads. Matt, thanks so much again for the time, and we will check you out again next month. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Take care, bud. You got it. There he is. Breaking sous vide down. And we've broken sous vide down from time to time here. Thank God Skype worked this time. Last time was a tragedy of seismic proportions.